Hi everybody, it's The Interviews with Will Alexander, brought to you by Canine Chronicle TV. Today in the hot seat we have Mr. Clay Cody. So I'm sure you'll enjoy this one. Hi everybody, today we have a special guest, we have none other than Mr. Clay Cody. How are you today, Clay? I'm good, Well, how are you? Good, it's good to see you. How's the weather there in the sunny south? It's just it's starting to get better. Yeah? <laughs> We've had a record summer heat. Oh, too hot, yeah. Yes. At least it's a dry heat, though, it's not so There you go, there you go. That's why you, you dry out your skin, it starts hanging. <laughs> nice. <Fair enough. laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's get right right to it. Um, tell me how you got first involved in the sport of dogs, Clay. Well, it was really an accident. I was working at a stable and cleaning stalls so that I could ride these rental horses for free. And the people had a dog, um, an, an amber toy which today is called a Toy Fox Terrier, and the breed looks exactly the same. And the owners of the stable asked me, she was bred, and they asked me if I would like to have a puppy, and I said, sure. So I went to my next door neighbor, and uh, he, I asked him to build me a doghouse. He was a carpenter. How old were you, Clay? Twelve. Okay. Seventh grade. So I, uh, and he asked me what size, and I said, well, about like this and like this, and uh, he said, what are you getting? I said, I'm getting an amber toy, which at the time was, a, was registered by the UKC, not the AKC. So he said, uh, you don't want a amber toy. He says, you want a Samoy. Well, he just happened to have a friend that had a litter of Samoids. So we went over there, and we... They, they were. I mean, at Samoy puppies at eight weeks old, they don't get any cuter than that. And, and I took my choice. And um, the guy owed him a favor, so I was able to buy this dog for $40. My father gave me $40 to buy this dog. So then, fast forward, a few months later, um, there was a local dog show in Arizona, and these people showed their dogs. And so they asked me if I would show my dog and I said sure I'd be glad to I'd love to and uh, so in the day the uh, Sewer State Kennel Club had uh, dog training classes every Saturday at some little park in Phoenix and uh, I took my dog over there and I learned how to handle her and, I, and one of the people that were teaching at the time was Dixie McCauley now that's a name that most people will not remember it's boxer people she's pretty well known in the breed in the day in the 60s we're talking like 1962 so um uh they you know i, I did the thing every week i was enthusiastic about it i enjoyed it and uh they entered her at the dog show they entered her in the american bread class and uh the time the entry fee was six dollars which i thought was like exorbitant <laughs> But um, uh, I showed her, and uh, first I took her to a grooming shop, and I got her bathed, and I got her trimmed. Uh, the groomer was an old, old handler from Grandview, Illinois, by the name of Harlan Schwander, which again, I don't think there's anybody alive other than me that remembers Harlan Schwander. So he had, he had been... Um, he lost his license for um, punching out a judge in Kankakee, Illinois. <laughs> he was an old alcoholic. All my role models basically were alcoholics. 
So, um, anyways, he, he bathed her and trimmed her up, and, and I went to the show, and I had this big box that I kept her in, and my father dropped me off at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I sat there with my dog, and I brushed on her and brushed on her, and then I went in and showed her. Well, she, you know, she had a far too long a nose, and she's a little bit low on leg, and, and none of these things I realized, but she was the cleanest and the whitest dog there, and um, uh, there were two in the class, and she went second, <laughs> but they also had a junior showmanship class, and I was eligible to do that, and the day you signed up, then they had a professional handler uh, judge the class. And I went into the novice class, and there were six kids in there, and I was third. So I thought, well, that's okay, but going second in the class. So the next day I decided that, which was the Superstition Count Club, which is in Mason, we went to the Superstition Count Club, and same thing happened. I went second in the class of two, and I thought, uh, I got to get another dog because this isn't working for me. I mean, I was immediately competitive. I wanted a blue ribbon no matter what. And um, so I met some very, very well, very well known Samoy people, a woman by the name of Jean Blake, who had a, um, she was showing a dog called um, um, Shoshone of Whitecliff, and Whitecliff was a very famous Samoyed kennel at the time, and that lady taught me to trim the feet and uh, the whiskers, and, and uh, was very encouraging to me. Um, and then, um, by the, the next group of shows, I had another Samoyed, and she was a little better, and she could win the American Bread class. Where I really got going well was um, uh, a couple years later, the Samoy comes running through the front yard, and I captured him. And I kept him hostage until somebody put an ad out that there was a dog missing. So I called the people up, and I said, I think I have your dog. His name was Cisco Broken Bow. He was a dog from Morrison, Colorado. And at the time, there were several really good Samoyed kennels in Morrison, Colorado. And these people were wealthy oil people, and they had bought this dog for their children when they were born. And uh, Cisco was a good dog. And they put my name on the dog and let me show him. And uh, um, I showed him in a puppy match. I won the working group under a judge called Frank Hayes Birch, who some people still remember. Uh, then um, uh, I took him out. First show, I got a five-point major on him under Billy Pym from Canada. Do you remember him? Billy. Billy Pym. No, I don't know. Yes, he's a very well-known judge in Canada. He would be... Um, he would be comparable to Jimmy Reynolds or somebody like that. This is all in the 60s. Yeah, okay. Hmm. And, uh, you know, this is my first five-point major and, and uh, first point, and I was thrilled. Um, so fast forward, you know, I was in the seventh grade when I got started, and when you're in the seventh grade, your teachers are trying to point you towards some kind of vocation. And I couldn't think of anything that I wanted to be. Anything. I, there was nothing I wanted to do. And um, so when I got to this show, the first day, I mean, before I ever showed my dog, I thought, wow, these people are showing these dogs, and they're traveling all over the country, and this looks like fun. And, and I was just immediately, this is what I'm going to be, a dog animal. And then, true story, I never looked back. I never looked back. I that was my business, but I did. It affected my grades in school because I didn't care about school anymore. I'd go to school every day and just draw pictures of dogs or read anything I could about dogs. I had every magazine you could get, and and uh, that was it. So then a little bit further forward. Well, in the first of all, let me get back to the guy that I first had my dog groomed at. On the Monday after the show, I rode my bike over to his green shop, and he gave me a job bathing dogs. I bathed dogs for him a couple of years. 
Then, and he's the one that told me that I should work for Larry Downey. So, uh, I, in the meantime, Ben Brown moved to town. Ben Brown was the, uh, was the, was the person that taught Harry Sankster. He taught Rick Kishudian. Yeah, I mean, and he was old and he had asthma. He had moved from California to Arizona. And, and uh, uh, I worked for him. I painted his kennel. He never paid me anything. But um, uh, he, was, he was an icon in the business. So, um, uh, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you a quick story. When you get a driver's license when you're 15 years and nine months, and I, a learner's permit, I got a learner's permit. I had never driven, ever. I hadn't even sat on my father's lap. So we, we were going to California, and he was a big, heavy set man, and he got in the, in the passenger side. And I said, I don't know, drive it was a three-speed Ford Econo line, you know, with the motor in between, so you're looking straight down at the ground, and it's a, and it's a stick, and he's, and he's teaching me, telling me, put your foot on the clutch, start giving a little gas, let your clutch, let clutch up, put it in the second gear, push up, go up, and... Um, we go out of town, but we're, you know, <laughs> you can imagine what that looked like. We were chugging down the road, you know, every time I was trying to put the thing up and trying to learn it. So we got, finally got out of Phoenix, and we're going to California. And, um... And you were uh, driving? Huh? You were driving? I was driving. He went to sleep. And he didn't wake up until we were, this is in the summer, um, and, uh, it's, you know, it's hot and in Arizona. And what we did, because we, we had, we didn't have air conditioning, we filled the buckets of all the dogs with ice and we opened all the windows and we drove and, and so he said to me, they need, they need to have, have air and they need to have water. So we would go. Anyways, we went and, and we woke up and, uh, he woke up. No, actually, he didn't wake up. I, I'm in the middle of rush hour traffic in Los Angeles, and I can't get over. I don't know how to use the mirrors. And I finally I started yelling at him, and I woke him up. And, and he said, I, I said, I got to get out of here. I'm scared to death. So he looks at me in the mirror, and he says, you can go. You can get, you can get in the next lane. Finally, we got off there, and then he started driving. So that was, I learned that. I learned how to drive from this man. <laughs> so then, um, uh, threw you in the fire, they'll just go and do it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, so, uh, things are going well with my family. They weren't interested in dogs at all. And, um, uh, I got a job. There's a story about that one too, with Larry Downey. And uh, that's probably the one of the best things that ever happened to me. I mean, God was truly watching me. You know, he was watching over me because I ended up with a, a, a couple, very hardworking, talented uh, business people. And, uh, and they had a little, they had a farmhouse in Libertyville, Illinois, and they had a little little room in the back. I actually had to go outside to get to the room. And they asked me if he wanted to, if I would stay there. And I said, sure. They yeah, had a, a couch that had a bed that rolled out, and then that was like a, it looked like a roller coaster. And I slept in that bed for three and a half years, actually four, because after they quit, I still stayed there for four months before I got married to Bergen. So, um, but the thing is with those people and the work ethic and the fact that, and they were doggy and, and you know, there was an AKC book of standards on the kitchen table every night and, and there were always questions and, and, you know, they'd be reading it and I'd be reading it and we would talk about dogs, dogs, dogs. And they, they, God, they didn't have any children so I became, I actually became their child. And, um, uh, you know, when I think about it years and years later, I could have been, I could have gotten into 
and I didn't know where I was going. I went to Illinois, you know, as I said, actually, I was not even 17 years old. I was, I started working for him on June 20th. My birthday was until June 30th, and I turned 17. I lied to them. I told them that I was 18 because I didn't think they would hire me. And, um, and I worked like like a slave. I mean, these people said, you know, you have no self-discipline, and you need to work for somebody that's strong. And I'm telling you, I learned words that I never heard of before when he was yelling at me. I mean, and most of them were, it was calling me. So, <laughs> So, you know, people need to understand that because, you know, Birgit and I had some really good help. And a lot of them are very good. They, they make a living showing dogs. They don't just do it as a, a hand, you know, as, as uh, what do they call it? The glory trail. So I learned how to save money. That's an important thing if you're going to be on it. I also learned that you had to charge Regardless, and it was very difficult when you start handling, it's very difficult to charge people because you, you don't feel that you are good enough. Sure. And I, we charged and, and we kept it a business. And, and when Bert and I got married, we, well, uh, you know, we didn't have two cents to, to rub together. Yeah, let's just back up. Tell me how you met Birgit and how that all started. Well, okay. Um, we'll go from there and go into. Okay. Well, so it actually comes from the same cloth. She basically left home young. I basically ran away from home. She basically ran away from home, too. She went to England from Germany, from Hamburg, Germany, and she got a job in a, um, a kennel maid school in the day they had kennel maid schools. And then a lady by the name of Betty Malinka, who was the city clerk for the city of Gary, Indiana, had Scotty's, sand to him Scotty's, and she met Bergert over there and asked if she would come to the United States. And she did, and they went to dog shows, and uh, we'd be there set up, and when they would get there with the Scotty's and the Westies, uh, they'd set up, and I'd see them over there, and then all of a sudden they were set up behind us. She'd move everything, all of her crates, her tent, everything, and she was right behind us. So after a while, you know, I kind of figured, well, this girl, I mean, this went on show after show, and I thought, wow, maybe this girl likes me. So, you know, we became good friends, and, and um, then I was um, off one day a week, Tuesdays, and I would always go to her place, and then uh, didn't work the rest of the week, and uh, uh, it started from there, and... Uh, and we were a great team, actually, once we got married. We got married in 1970. Um, we were a great team. Great team. We worked Again. hard, and we had nothing. And, uh, and we, we paid off working hard. You know, we, we eventually uh, did very well. And, uh, but me being coming from Arizona, I worked for Larry and Alice for three and a half years. Another six months after he retired, then Berger and I got married, and then we lived there for another three years. And you know, when you're from Arizona and you're used to 300 bright, sunny days a year, uh, and it's it snows all winter, it rains all spring, it's hot, humid in the summer, and and you know we're taking care of dogs outside, exercise them. We're out there, we're snowing them out there. Picking poop out of the snow, you know, it's, it's... Where are you now? This was still in Libertyville, Illinois. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, it, it just, it wasn't good. And I finally told Berger, and, and, and we were able to buy a nice house at that time in St. Charles, Illinois. And, and it was beautiful, and I loved it, and I landscaped it. And, and uh, it worked out well. But I... I I said to Bergen one day, I said, you know, I'm going to jump off the roof and kill myself. I cannot take another day living in Illinois, and I want to move back to Arizona. So in the day, there was no money in Arizona, and the drive going back from California, you have to make most of shows in California. That's just too much. So again, we get back to Ben Brown, and he found me a place, found us a place, 
in Libertyville, not Libertyville, I'm sorry, Palmdale, California. And we worked out of there for two years. And then one day, Rick the shooting called me and says, Kid, I need you to buy my kennel. I said, okay, put the kennel on sale, on up for sale. We were, it was sold and we were ready to move in six months. So I said, Rick, we're ready to move. Okay, come on down, kid. Well, he didn't have any plans of moving. So we move in there. You know, and at the time, he's doing those those bronzes, and he's got this wax, and, and he's got this Bunsen burner, and he walks around the place with a cigar in his mouth, and he's wiggling on these dogs, and all day long, he's doing this. And, and the, the place, his place looked like a, a, a yellow paint bomb went off on it. The carpet was yellow, the building was inside, it was yellow, the outside, it was yellow. The fence in the front was falling down onto the sidewalk. It was a mess. And so I didn't know that cockroaches liked that wax from all that wax falling on the carpet, the yellow carpet. As you could tell it was yellow because it was looked black. And the place was full of cockroaches. It was a mess. So you know, I mean most people know that Berg is very fastidious and very clean and very organized and she wants things done right. Well she I, I thought she was gonna either kill me or Rick. And uh, when we moved down there, we had um, uh, Marippi worked for us, Bernie Kush worked for us, Darlene Higuchi, if you don't know who she was, she was, she's the late, she's the gal that eventually married Joe Waterman. Oh, okay. So she worked for us. Andy Linton worked for us only on the weekends. So we're all there, and then Rick has got all of his employees in the back room working on these molds and, and we're trying to clean the place up and he's got his dogs there, we have our dogs there. He was married to Sandy Kashubian at the time and, and um, it was the biggest mess you ever saw. So, believe it or not... Did he tell you he was staying? St well, he had an apartment. We, uh, we, we had, we had a, a four-year-old son, Ryan. And we, the area is, it's, it's, it's an industrial area in, in, in Sun Valley, California. We called it Slum Valley. Uh, a lot of kennels there. Uh, Woody Warren lived there. So, really, a, a year later, uh, Rick moved. Rick and Sandy moved. He moved to Louisiana. And uh, I actually, as much hell as I put Birgit through by making her go through all that, and Marippi, Marippi and Birgit got very close, and they, I do believe they were planning on buying a gun and killing him, and maybe two, me too. <laughs> great. It was unbelievable. But what a lesson. You know, Larry Downey was a great teacher, but Rick, in his own right, is a great teacher. He's a great trimmer and he can explain things just beautifully so you could really understand them I, I, he just had a gift of gab and, and he could do that and he was willing to do that so well, that was a very big positive in my life and an actual burger's life too because, but even though she hated him and she was impossible to live with at that time she got better once he moved <laughs> but we had a pretty good life for a while there, quite a while. But uh, um, uh, you know, there's stories I could tell you. But anyway, we're, we're still trying to get down to how I got into the business and what happened. And, and yeah, this is great. Just keep rolling. <laughs> um, but Rick, Rick, I have to give him credit. He was a great teacher, and he taught me a lot. And. Uh, um, and we, Berg and I, we lived there for 20 years. We worked out of that place, and, and it was, we cleaned it up. Believe me, we cleaned it up. And, uh, uh, and it was just like Rick said, you know, it was a, uh, a gold mine. In pet grooming, did a lot of pet grooming. And this I was taught from Larry, because I did pet grooming there. Um, boarding, you did anything you could to make money because at the time, the 
the AKC and the PHA, not the PHA, the American Chemical controlled hammers. You had to, number one, have a, a kettle. And that actually turned out to be a godsend for me. You know, we did everything that the AKC, which was Len Brumby, controlled it. Uh, we did everything that he said. You know, he even told me one time, I want you to wear um, a blue coat and tan pants. And I did it. So, but anyways, uh, then they, PHA was going to sue, or actually it was Rick. <laughs> they were going to suspend and the PHA got behind him and um, that's when Bob and Jane were ahead, or Jane, uh, Bob was head of the PHA at the time and uh, the AKC threw up their hands and said okay we're not going to have any more control over professional handlers and I thought well that's very good that's very good but it turned out it wasn't very good you know because uh, you know, there was an apprentice program in the day. Now, you know, we're talking from the 60s, and, and um, they stopped about the late 70s, early 80s is when the AKC gave up and said no more. No more licensing handlers and licensing assistances. Assistance. I think we wouldn't with the, with the qualifications they had back then. We probably wouldn't have half the handlers we have now. No, no. And... Uh, well, the main thing is, is that, you know, so many of them work out of their garage now. That's not a good deal, you know. By keeping the kennels, and by, by the way, when all this has stopped, the AKC, a lot of people sold their kennels. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, that's where a lot of them could have retired in the, on the money that, you know, with inflation, that those kennels became, with that property alone, kennel property alone in Los Angeles is, very difficult to get and very expensive. Sure. So, um, um, we, we, we pretty much stayed the way uh, old school type stuff. And, you know, and, you know, they used to talk about old school when I was young. And I think, oh, you're crazy. But believe me, it, 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 it helped. And, and it, I actually think the AKC should get back into watching it because of... Uh, yeah. I, I don't see as many things, bad things happening as I did in the 60s, uh, but so I'm sure there's some going on, and you know, I don't know what's happening. So, um, nonetheless, we worked hard, you know, we were a good team, you know, uh, what Bertie did was she was the opposite of me, she could, she did books, she was organized, and she taught me a lot. And the one thing she really taught me was saving money. So, and during that time, we had a lot of good people, a lot of kids coming in from Japan yeah, yeah. and, and Scotland. Great assistance. Really some good ones. They came there because they wanted to learn, like I did. Uh, I mean, I went there, I worked for $40 a week for three and a half years, never asked for a raise, and they never thought about giving me a raise either. But I went to learn. <laughs> so, um, and that's what a lot of them did, you know. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of successful ones. You know, Greg Strong is a good businessman. He works hard. He runs, you know, he's a good, yep. good solid person. Um, he comes to mind, but there's dozens more. And uh, Marippi, she started working for us right after college. She was the cutest, prettiest little girl you ever saw. And funny, she could keep me laughing. I mean, she kept me laughing every day. I mean, she was the highlight of my day most of the time. <laughs> till the end, yeah. which wasn't a real happy ending, but no endings are, I guess. It's not from this business. But, uh, uh, but I would say... But, you know, as, as we were learning and she went through the Ricochetian experience and, and she she saw all this and, and things were wild in the day with us. I mean, it was, it was just nonstop all the time. And um, then I would say I would make her really the best assistant that we ever had. And I think she worked there for five, maybe six years. And I handled dogs again out of Arizona, which is very difficult. The driving would drive me crazy. And, you know, the, the, 
the truck that I had had to have two generators and three air conditioners on it because you would go from Phoenix, Arizona, where it's 114 degrees, to Houston, Texas, where it's 105 degrees with humidity, and you'd have 25 dogs in this truck and four employees. Yeah. And uh, I, I lived in fear of a, of a, of a flat tire getting stuck out in the middle of the desert and where the motor going on. So we, you know, I took very good care of those trucks and knock on wood, we never had any problems. Uh, and Birgit did too. She took very good care of those trucks and, uh, uh, you know, we were always putting the tires on them because I just hated changing tires. Mm. So, always thought of the worst case scenario and, and tried to avoid that. And, uh, Great planning. A lot of us don't do that, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I ran out of gas once, and that's the last time I ever ran out of gas. That's a pain in the neck, too. So. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I get those stories until you go, you know, you'd be sick of listening to them, but uh, we'll, we'll try and bypass it and, and just get this this history going. Uh, and uh, so, anyways, I moved here and, and, uh, uh, and I finally bought a piece of property that uh, I had known about because I was raised here. It was a real rundown dump, but it had a license, you know, a, a kind of license. It's very hard to do. And, and it was grandfathered then, and uh, I bought it, and, and I, I spent more money on attorneys keeping it a kennel because it was, it was now it's in a residential area. But it's in a very exclusive city in Paradise Valley where, you know, they, you have to have an acre to have a house and they don't want businesses in that town. And, and then long story short, the city, after years, became very, very good to me after a two-year lawsuit because I, I did what I promised them I would do. I told them I would make it beautiful, and I did. So... Uh, the kennel, I don't think you really want to hear so much about. It's just the history. I showed the dogs out of here, you know. And um, I was very fortunate. Both of us were very fortunate. We got good dogs. We got good clients. Good clients are very important, as you know. And good dogs are important. I mean, it was a period of time there when we were in California. Bergett and I were both, I mean, we were golden. And, and we had more clients than we could, well, most of the clients just finally left, I couldn't find them dogs that I wanted to show. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, they would go by the wayside. And, uh, I think of the potential these people had. The, the mere fact that they had the interest, they wanted to spend the money, and they wanted a good dog. And hard to find. That's right. That's hard to find nowadays. It is nowadays. But seriously, I mean, I guess that was in the... The golden days of the dog shows. You know, I, I think about it. I mean, it was a lot of interest in dogs. This was when Santa Barbara was beautiful, and Beverly Hills was beautiful, and the Chicago International was the great Chicago International, and Westminster, and da 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 da. Yeah. You know, great that's show. Great. So, a few weeks ago, I interviewed uh, Kenny Kenny Murray, and he he touched on you quite a bit. You tell me how you two met? You you guys became yeah. so close? Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you everything. It was some yeah, of them. Of course I, not. We don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I met him on the Texas circuit. And um, uh, he was my age. And he really did have the same interest I do. He had the same drive. And uh, I was showing a Labrador. The dog was in a gift to me from Larry. It was a bitch that picked a litter that people couldn't afford the board bill and we got it. And the bitch was, I guess, and the dog was signed by uh, Sean McVicker's Light Brigade. And his name was Hillsborough Wizard of Oz. And the story with him was, I, we went on the circuit, and we were on the circuit, and I got to know Ken, and in, on that circus, 10 shows, I finished that dog undefeated in the brief in the glasses. Wow. And that's hard to do the Labrador. It would be much harder to do today than it was then. But in that circuit, I got a second in the group under Phil Marsh and a second in the group under Annie Clark. You know, 
joining myself. And uh, pretty soon, uh, Ken was, he was following us to the shows. And the reason I was riding with him, following them, you know, and in the day, every show was, the Texas Circuit, you, you drove after every show, you know. You got there, you fed, you exercised, you got all set up, you went to bed at 1 o'clock in the morning, you got up at 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the morning, because you had to be there at 6. And, um, um, so we we stayed in touch. We talked to him all the time on the phone. Then we'd go down to Texas, and um, uh, he had a, a limited in the day. They gave limited handlers licenses, and we had a limited handlers license. And uh, I said to him, I said, "You know, you got to work for a handler. You know, you just you can't do this just from pure love or or, or drive. Uh, I mean, some people have, but." It, doesn't work for most of them. So I got him a job. Um, I, didn't get, I talked him into working for Dick Cooper. And this was when uh, Larry and Alice were quitting. And um, he had, Dick Cooper had a guy by the name of Harry Hayes that was working for him. And he was leaving. And I said, well, please come and work for this guy. Or, you know, help me. So, okay, he went there. And I, and I said to him, I said, you know, he's got a, a dog. She's a little bit sketchy, and, and uh, don't, don't <laughs> get rid of this girl. I mean, she's a little difficult. And so long story short, well, three months short, she's pregnant in three months, right? So Ken doesn't listen to me. <laughs> and, um, and then, <laughs> then, we want to talk about the apprentice of all time. We end up working for him for 12 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that was um, that was fun and interesting, and it was good, you know, that when when he moved there, then I had somebody to pal around with. And we were talking about dogs and dogs. And dogs. That's all we talked about with dogs, and uh, which is good. We both had the same interest. And, and again, uh, let me go back to Burger real quick. That was our interest also. You know, I was very fortunate that I found Burger. Because we did have the same interests, the same drive, and, and all that sort of thing. Was, you know, and same thing with Ken. Um, so, uh, then, then uh, I think Ken already had two children, and then Bergen and I moved to California because I was going to jump off a roof. And uh, so, my, my, yes, I'm repeating myself. So, Ken. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and, and I still hang out with him, and uh, and that's all we talk about are dogs, dogs, stories, stories until you make it sick, and uh, um, I always tell people, you know, I got him his job, his first job. <laughs> if he did anything right, it was because of me. <laughs> Nothing to do with big people or anybody else. <laughs> you basically started as a Samoids. What is your favorite breed now? You know, I, people always ask me that. It's, it really depends on the dog. Yeah. You know, the dog. I, 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 you know, I fall in love with dogs all the time. And, um, and I've been, again, I'll, I've been very lucky. And, and um, probably my favorite dog was, he's it, it, my best Stone in dogs and my biggest heartache in dogs was my wife Fox Terrier, George. George, yeah. And um, I was working for Bobby Stebbins the year you came on the Florida circuit. I think you won like every Bastion show. I can't remember. I, 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 I think I missed two of them. But I think there were, what, nine shows and he won seven. And Bobby and that, always sent me to watch you. Show, go watch Clay show a wire. <laughs> <laughs> But that was a great dog. I mean, really, it was probably, uh, uh, I would say one of the two really great dogs I ever showed. And, and he was such a wonderful dog to show. And then, then, and then one of the biggest, hardest things for me to learn, and it took me too long to learn it, because I, I'm going through this uh, 
huge problem and I, and I don't understand it and I don't know why and I'm blaming everybody else. But what he had was a petite mal seizures. He was starting epilepsy and then eventually he had grand mal seizures and then you could see it. So that was very sad. But probably the greatest win that I ever had in Dodge, the most fun win or the most hardest win was winning the breed at the garden when Peter had the uh, Galsall Excellence out. He was the number one dog on birds. And, and, um, and then the following night, Sharon and Professor Sherry was going, he was in a seizure. We walked into the ring and I literally was just holding him up and, and that was the worst, the worst. But um, yeah, and then um, Blossom and and my Lakeland bitch, she was, she was so much fun. Um, you remember Mrs. Whitmore up here, Eve Whitmore? Do I what? You remember Eve Whitmore, the judge? Oh, she loved that bitch. She talked about that bitch all the time. Did she? Yeah. 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 Canada has some good judges. They really do. I, mean, I, I can't say how much I like Jimmy Reynolds and, and Jimmy Lynn sure. and, and a few others, but uh, those two come to mind. And, and was we talk about terriers. Mrs. Whitmore always brought up that bitch. Yeah. 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 She was fun. She was. And she was a house pet. She really was. She was one of the first house pets that I had as a dog. That's and the reason for that is <laughs> when I came to work for Larry. Let's go back to that story. And I had my dog. My dog sat my sandwich, this guy, and he said, what is that? And I said, well, that's my dog. And um, he said, do you see all these dogs in this kennel? He says, they're all your dogs when they're here. Yeah. Get rid of them. And I did. I gave him to an uncle that had lived in Illinois, and he had a good life on a farm. Sure. But uh, I say that to help all the time when they come up with their dog. Do you see all these dogs in this kennel? They're all yours. <laughs> Love them. I like to, and I'll take a good example of that. Is, you, know, you, you may not know Bernie Kush. Bernie Kush was a standard schnauzer breeder and a carry breeder. And she had a dog named Callahan, a carry, that she'd been showing. And she brought him, and I said to her, Do you see all these dogs in this kennel? They're all yours. Get rid of them. Collecting dogs is a bad habit. I was taught that. <laughs> Which that can easily happen. You can collect dogs all day. And if you're going to be in the business and you're supposed to be making a living in it, you need to take care of your clients' business, your clients' dogs and worry about them. You don't have time to worry about your own dogs. And it works out just as well, believe me. But anyway, she let that dog go to, to England. And that was kind of a sad story. He went best and short crafts. Uh, the people kind of, according to her, stole the dog from her. And then I'm pretty, pretty sure that uh, the, the super dog, Kay, that Bill McFadden showed, came dog down from that dog twice. And, um, and, uh, and, and I love that carry. I thought that was a great dog, but you know, and so you know, it's, it's it's the way it's supposed to be, I guess. You know, the dog did great things for the breed, this Callahan, and, and you know, she blamed me for making her get rid of the dogs and stuff. Like that. That's that's one of the stories that we talk about doing that. But, but you know, we're talking about professional handlers. That's one of the things. That's the way and the kind of things I was taught. Yeah. But, you're taking care of your clients' dogs, and they are your own dogs while they're in your care. Very true. About that story, which is just through my life, I just, when I start talking, I get off on the different side. <laughs> it's great, though. <laughs>
And then um, I was quitting that year. That was in 2000. In 99, 99. And I, I saw the dog at Devon. I was really taken with him, and I, I never put my hands on him, but I watched somebody go over him one time. I watched him go, like, you know, I put the hands on his neck all the way to his shoulders, all the way to his uh, tail, and, and uh, backwards and everything else. It just, uh, and I thought, wow, it really is a good dog. But then, you know, Ben McFadden is, um, is a talent. You know, in the day, in, in the days when I showed... Um, I, I showed a lot of carries, and um, a lot of them in the 70s and 80s were crazy, just crazy. They go, they get into the ring, they start fighting, they start vomiting, that white foam that came out of them, you know. And, um, uh, but Bill, the last two carries that I saw him show a campaign, they were stand-up show dogs, which is the way I preach today about terriers. I, I don't like it when people spar them because you know I've had to, I've had to spar dogs just because you didn't really want to see them. You know, <laughs> so we can make them look good. But nowadays, it's the, the whole terrier world has changed in, in the fact that terriers have to do, and they, and they are for the most part. People are they're getting smarter. They have to do what a Doberman does. They have to do what a boxer does. And, you know, they have to do what the dog is stand up, show dog. It shows on their own. And you, this business of sparring them drives me crazy. I try never to spar terriers. I don't like it. You know, it, it destroys some dogs. It makes some dogs look very good for just one minute. And what do you have when you have a dog that's a, a, looks absolutely fantastic sparring? And then he goes around the ring and, he, you know, it looks like a ride at Disneyland or something. It's just ridiculous, you know. So, you know, you say, well, wow, I'm going to put that dog over. Let's take him around and like, oh, no, i got to rejudge this class, you know. So I try not to the spare dogs. I and mean, I'm one of the few terrier people that, that do, but, you know, terriers can be shown like all the rest of the other breeds and they can be stand-up show dogs. So... Uh, what, you, what year do you start judging then? You retired in I, I wasn't going to judge. Huh? You retired in 1999 or 2000? About 2000, actually. Okay. But I, I wasn't going to judge, and I think in probably 2002 or 2003. And it was Ken Murray. <laughs> he calls me. He says, if you're going to judge, then this is the last time that you can get 26 breeds at the time and you know they changed that all the time you can get 26 breeds and i said all right i'll you know i'll try it so i applied for 26 breeds and i applied for dogs i liked the dogs i felt comfortable with in all 26 uh, sorry in all seven groups and i had 13 um working dogs because i wanted to work get the working group first. I did not want the terrier group because if you're going to judge terriers, especially in the beginning, and you get like into the certain areas up in the Dakotas and the Midwest and the deep south and sometimes the wrong time of the year, you know, you'll get 25 terriers. You know? It's not worth going there. So I wanted the working group and um, I finished my all my provisionals fast. And I applied for the working group, and uh, let's see, they must have had, because I could get 13 more, and I applied 13, 26, but they added three more breeds to it. And the AKC gave me those three breeds also, so they actually gave me 17 breeds the second time, and then I had the working group. And uh, uh, the, the AKC's been very good to me, you know. I've tried my best. Try to keep clothes clean, uh, which isn't easy for me. Uh, and they, um, they've been good. I've no problems. And but, you know, it's been like I go four or five years without applying for dogs, you know, any more breeds. And, and uh, yeah, I, my kennel, I built a huge kennel. And, you know, I got interested in that. And, and I 
actually met as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, when I built it, I didn't plan on putting handling. It just became so lucrative that I thought, well, I just better. I would I would prefer to stay home and pick up poop and go to these dog shows that were driving me crazy at the time. You know, and help wasn't as easy to find in those days. It really wasn't. You know, I mean, towards the end, there I had some really good, really good friends. One of them was Jorge. Mm. Jorge was was excellent help. The other one was um, is Chewy. Do you know Chewy in Texas? No. Texas. Oh, what's his name? I only call him Chewy. <laughs> but anyways, it was good. I, I had several at the end there, but but I was at this, the last two dog shows that I made as a handler, and <laughs> I had uh, I, I had. Jorge well, had quit, Vicky had quit, we all got out on their own, and someone else quit. And I had one good kid, two others that had worked for me, there had been some dog shows that were okay. And then a new kid that had just come from Mexico to become a handler. Okay. He brought a camera with him, and uh, he got to the dog show, and that's the last I ever saw him. He's out taking pictures of everything, and that was it. I was so disgusted, and I had a full load of dogs. I ran seven groups in two days. The best in show the first day, and I didn't win the group with that dog the second day, but I still won seven groups. And I'm driving home, and I'm thinking, you know, and it was just such an exasperating weekend for me. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, I think I'd just rather stay home and pick up poop and go through this, this mess. And that's what I did. <laughs> and I, but anyways, so I, I, you asked me about judging. And Ken called me a couple years later and said, you better do it now. And I said, okay. Well, I, thought, well, I wouldn't know if I'd like judging or not. And, and, and judging, by the way, is, is, is on the job training also. You may think you know about dogs. You may know about dogs. And you may have read that standard 20 times. But you really have to judge each individual breed. And it's best if you judge them around the country so you can see what each part of the country has to offer because it's not always the same. Yeah. You know, you can get Labradors in one area, for example, and get some fabulous dogs. Enjoy it. I mean, like, it's fun to judge them. You know, the next week you could be doing 30 Labradors and somewhere else. I won't say where. And it's like, oh my God, this is painful. So, I mean, it is, it's, it's something I don't know a lot of people think about, but it's, it's you really have to do it. And, and I, and I can remember start, when I first started judging, and I, I still do when I judge. And it's like, oh my God, can I get five minutes off to read this standard again, you know? But again, you learn. That's the way you learn, is on-the-job training. And don't tell me anybody ever started judging, went out there and didn't go, oh my God, what did I get myself into? You know, it takes a while to understand it and, and to get the feel for it. And, and when you're judging a lot, and there was a point there where I was judging 40 weekends a year, you know, you get into the groove. And, um, you know, and a lot of the things that, that help you as being a hammer, and, and they and they, it helps if you want to be helped is the fact that you know you you, you get people that say things to you and, 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 and you it's in code you know what they're saying to you and, you know they're, they're pimping this dog and you know that you know, it's like you know don't piss on my boots and tell me it's raining brother I've done this for 40 years you know <laughs> I waited behind poles and waited for those judges to walk around there and so I could start up a conversation and get my quote unquote code in there. So, but, uh, so, you know, the only reason for judging that I can see that anybody would want to do is that it is definitely a challenge. Yeah. And it's a challenge. And it can only, it, it only benefits me. The judge. It only benefits the judge and the fact that you can walk out of there and say, Wow, I really liked I really thought I did a good job today. But on the other hand, I've also walked out of there and goes, Man, I screwed that up. Why did I do that? You know, it's 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 just 
the way it is, I guess. I think that's natural, you know, second guess yourself sometimes. Right, right. Well, it used to be I knew who, who was a good judge, I knew who was a crook, I knew who was, was everything, and that's the way I treated them. <laughs> you're a crook? Okay, you want to be a crook? I'll take care of you. You know, you want to be a good judge? I'll give you all the respect in the world, you know, so. But it's, it's, it's different, and actually, as I'm judging, there's some people, there's, there's some real, actually really good judges out there, really good. And then there's a few that uh, I don't think they ever learn. You know? they just, they, some people just don't have it, right? They can't. So. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, next question. All right. <laughs> if you had to, um, let's say, uh, who, who, if you had to, who would you like to have, had, have dinner with in dogs, of dog people that have passed? Who, who would you wish you could still speak um, let's start with Lang Skyra. I thought he was the most complete, down to earth gentleman in the business. Yeah. And he pulled no punches. You know, if he was judging a dog and there were 20 people in the ring and they could all stand there, and he would say to you, okay, Will, take this dog down and back. Okay, Will, take the dog around. Okay, it's not like it's, uh, oh, I gotta pretend I don't know you, and then he could still judge the dogs, right? Oh, for sure. I used to love that. I used to love that. And the, the fact that he just absolutely was not phony about nothing. He was down to earth, you could talk dogs to him, and uh, and he had some great stories. I, I, I had dinner with him many times, and I loved him. And the same thing with Annie Clark. She didn't say, take him down, Clay. Take the dog down and back, Clay. Go around, Clay. <laughs> but she had another way about her. <laughs> it was kind of more grandiose. But I loved and respected her. Uh, one of the persons, people, that I really should mention, that I they did so much for Birgit and I, was Winnie Heckman. She really was on our side and, and really did a lot for us. And he was also. Personally, there's another judge I wanted to talk about that I could, would like to have dinner with. Jimmy Reynolds is very interesting when you go to dinner with him. He's fun. But he's still around, so we need to find somebody that's not here anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I, okay, let's, let's go with those, you know, Lang and Annie and Winnie, but, and Winnie was, uh, she was hilarious, and but what she did was one of the things, she just really liked Bernard and I, and really helped us a lot, promoted us, sent us dogs, sent us dogs with good clients, and um, so I have a great deal of appreciation for her. Yeah, we all need those people, it's, those are far a few between again. I, when I was showing dogs, I remember I was a young handler, and Lang was judging, and I had a very famous Ira setter up here. And he just retired on, brought a new dog out. Lang was doing the specialty, and uh, he's, he's talking. He always chatted to me and called me Will. He, he asked me, "Is this is this related to your old dog?" And I, I said, "I was just being cocky." I said, "He wasn't." I said, "Yeah, of course he was." Right? He gives me off the sex. He told me he didn't never like my old dog. <laughs> 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 I'll never forget that. that. That kind of honesty is is good. You know, that's a famous story. Um, he and Harry Sankster were very close. And um, they were betting on um, a basketball game or a football game or something like that. And they bet $100. And, and this, again, was in the 60s. You know, 100 bucks was a lot of money so Lang is in, he's in Yuma, Arizona, and he, and he gives Harry first in the class. And this is a, with a Doberman. And this is another day where Dobermans were a big breed in the mid-60s and 70s. And, you know, there's nothing to have 40, 50 Dobermans. So Lang gives him the blue ribbon, and Harry Sankster hands him the $100 bill. <laughs> he says, thanks, Lang. <laughs> 
And there's other people standing around there watching this. You, know, you couldn't get away with this today. No. no. But you had to know Lang, you know. And Lang goes, wow, don't do that. <laughs> so, by the way, I just thought of something. I just remembered something. My first time I ever showed in junior, hand, junior showmanship, my first dog show, uh, George, George Payton. Oh. Yeah. He was the judge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, before he started, I went now around and watched, uh, watched the, uh, the handler that was going to do this. So I followed him around because he knew a couple hours earlier who was going to be the judge. So he's, he gets this ribbon, he gets this best of breed, and he's standing there talking to the judge. And the dog goes to lift his leg, <laughs> the judge's leg. <laughs> and George caught him. Just, just, in the nick of time. And he made the sign of the sign of the cross. He said, oh my God, <laughs> he got out of that. But it was, it was. Uh, I, I just thought, well, this guy's kind of funny, and he should, he should be fun to show. And I mean, again, I'm only like 13 years old, 12, 13 years old, and I, I still thought that was funny. And I never forgot it. And that's you know, that's 1961 or 62. So not many people know who George Payton is either, do they? No, that's for sure. Yeah, I yeah. Remember, they had a trivia question up here about George, and it was, uh, he had won the toy group of the garden with an IG. And nobody knew that up here. I did. <laughs> really? Yeah, he won it in like 1963, I think he won the toy group of the garden. I knew that, because I was, I, I had every dog magazine there was. Now I get those things and I can barely open them. But that's all I thought about when I was a kid. Me too. I used to have stat we used to have newspapers up here, Dogs in Canada was a newspaper and I used to spend my time circling the dogs I liked and I would pick best dog on page. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a picture. You were a judge already. Yeah. <laughs> so as a as a you're you're a you were a great handler and you're a great judge. Do you have any advice for uh, a young person that wants to do the sport of dogs as a living? <laughs> Well, the first thing you want to tell people, because nobody told me how much work it is if you're going to do it, uh, the second thing is keep it a business. I mean, that's probably the one thing that is, has helped me in my whole life, is that I kept it a business. I don't give it away. Um, I'll tell you, Forrest Hall, do you remember Forrest Hall? Forrest Hall told me. Who he is. <laughs> Forrest Hall told me. He signed my handler's application. He and Dick Cooper signed my handler's application. Um, um, the, um, he said, be nice. He said, but not too nice. He says, oh, they'll walk on you. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, today's a different world. I could have been nicer. You know, I went into a funky time in my life, and I, I got just a little bit too irritating, too irritating to people. I got a little bit too arrogant to talk to things, which I, probably the worst thing I ever did was I wasn't, well enough, um, I wasn't, uh, I, I, I hate to say the word, but I, I actually didn't have enough class not to be arrogant, you know, to be more of a politician, like, you know, look at, I mean, not like Trump, but be that more like a politician, yeah. <laughs> like a normal politician. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say be, don't be arrogant, just don't be arrogant. Take care of your dogs. Take care of business. Send your bills out. Okay? And then if they want to know, I made plenty of mistakes. I could tell them the stuff that I did that I wish that I had never done. And I wish that I had never said. And, you know, that stuff comes back and you think about it years later and you, and you think, God, I wish I hadn't done that. Or, God, I wish I hadn't said that. Or, or you know, God, I wish I had done this. <laughs> you know, I'd have done that, you know. Or, um, or, um, 
taxi. And I wish I had nothing to do with it, but you know, as I said, when, when I was quitting and, and uh, Carrie, I had some kind of a, was told about this dog before Bill got it, this mech, that Carrie. I have uh, Kyle, uh, if I kept handling and I had that dog, then I'd be stuck for another three years showing dogs. But, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot I could tell people. You know, you know, be humble and, and um, don't be arrogant and have some class. And, and I must say, the whole business has changed. You know, when I, show, when I judge dogs, it absolutely amazes me. The, the, the grace, the attitude, um, and the professionalism that some of, some of these handlers have today. What? And I wish that I had that. I really do. I wish you know, that I had, if I, I had known that this is what you really needed to do, I could have done a lot better. And I did well enough. But uh, uh, the, the world has changed. The dog world has changed in particular. And uh, I'm, uh, no, see what but yeah, I, and as a matter of fact, I do tell people all the time, you know, people that ask me, like, not that they work for me or anything like that, but like, you know, what does it take, what would you do, da 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 um, and, uh, yeah, I would help, I help anyone, I was taught that, that was one of the things I taught you, you give back, you help, you help other people. You kind of answered my next question, though. What advice would you give 20-year-old Clay Cody if you could talk to him now? That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so I already answered it for me. Be humble and, and be, well, be careful what you say because he may come back to haunt you. you know, don't be arrogant. That's what I would tell him. And keep it a business. As I said before, that's very important. Okay. <laughs> This has been great, Clay. I really appreciate this. this oh, thanks, yeah, thanks for asking. I was actually very afraid to do this because <laughs> I never Zoomed before. This is the first time. <laughs> uh, everybody, I Zoomed with Will. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was great. I really enjoyed this interview. Thanks so much. And uh, I won't keep you any longer, but that, that was great, Clay. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for asking. Will. We'll see you down the road. Yeah, I'm sure we'll see you somewhere. It was great to see you. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, Clay. That was a very good interview. I'm sure everybody found you inter interesting and fascinating at the same time. Uh, if you like what we're doing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. And don't forget, if you want to get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. And if you want to find out what's happening at Will's World, go to willalexander.net. And one more plug, if you want to find out about all my grooming seminars and grooming courses, go to Leading Edge Dog Show Academy. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon.